am the dean you know I am the dean you need I am the dean you love Please come back to me I am the dean you know I am the dean you need I am the dean you love Please come back to me Each of these faiths, Judaism, Christianity and Islam have a particularly subjective view on Jesus. None of us, myself standing here, Pastor Bobby standing there, uh, my good friend Jabulani Mkize who will be the next speaker standing, none of us can say we have an objective view on Jesus. So what we need to then do is to not necessarily deconstruct but to critically examine the historical, the scientific and the scriptural evidence in respect of Jesus and from that we basically um, try and separate or try and come to an understanding or maybe a common understanding to discern what can be viewed as plain truth and what can be viewed as constructed what can be viewed as fact what can be viewed as fiction now like I emphasize again we're not debating anything here today we're going to put forth a particular perspective. It might be palatable, it might not be palatable. Uh, there might be things that both uh, Muslim as well as Christians might not wish to hear. But we're not going to be in any sense offensive. There's not going to be a polemical <coughs> discourse that you'll be hearing. Um, one of the particular speakers, I think it's probably George Orwell, he says, the truth which makes men free is the truth which in most part men prefer not to hear. In other words, anything that you want to submit as being uh, the truth in any instance, you'd find there'd be a response, there'd be a reaction. When Jesus was in this world and he came with the truth and he came with the message and confronted the ecclesiastical hierarchy of his time, the, the, um, the so-called scribes and the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there was a response, not surprisingly because he challenged the established order. He was a social agitator of his time. One could call him an anarchist. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the same thing happened. They challenged the religious establishment. They challenged the political establishment. They challenged the economic establishment. And there was a necessary, there was, that necessitated a particular response. Unfortunately, many of us today, Muslims as well as Christians, we go to the mosques, we go to the churches, Week in, week out, we hear the same thing, pray like this, hallelujah, um, what to read in the Salah, etc., etc., and on and on. We need to go beyond, it's like giving milk. When you give a baby milk all the time, and the baby develops, and then over time you want to feed the baby with milk, and milk, and milk, there's going to come a time when the baby needs chicken, and meat, and vegetables. You need to go beyond the milk, and that's what we're appealing to both Muslims and Christians. Now, I'm sure most of you know what this is. All of you, do you know what this is? Anyone, tell me, well, what is this place? This is good old Chatsworth. You have here the Chatsworth Stadium and you have there an enclave of houses. Now, I've got a map of the Chatsworth community. Um, in fact, I come from a place in Reservoir Hills near the, in fact, near the, in fact, I would say accurately speaking, near the Pine Town area. Um, some of these areas have been, as a result of the Group Areas Act, um, separate racial enclaves. People of different religious groupings, people of different racial characteristics stay in isolation. And we've inherited this legacy in the past, past as a result of this apartheid legacy, people in enclaves. In Chatsworth you had a community where there were predominantly Indians staying here. And by and large over the past say 20, even 30 years, Chatsworth has become a multicultural hotspot. When I say multicultural, you have, for example, in the Bayview community, I'm told, people from the Zanzi area, the Zanzibaris. You have foreigners coming. And now we see quite often, amongst us Indians, we see whites. 
I, I was told the other time, I, I don't know if you told me or uh, Abdul Khalik told me, there was a, a group of white, young white students who we met, say, uh, I think, sometime last year, and they got a, uh, they, on their ties, they've got their um, LDS, Latter day Saints, the Church of the Latter day Saints of Jesus Christ. Those are the Mormons, you'd call them the Mormons. But they find themselves in chats with the area. Then you'd find, for example, people like the Jehovah's Witnesses will be in the chats with the area. Then you'll find white Americans in the chats with the area. Then you'll find peddlers coming to the chat with the area. Things such as heroin, which you'd find from the darkest recesses of Afghanistan, being sold as sugars and crack and the whole host of factors that you can find in the chat with the area. So we are a multicultural hotspot. I don't come from chat. Multicultural hotspot, and with a multi being a multicultural hotspot, it's got I, it's got problems which are intrinsic to multicultural communities. Now, with that <coughs> comes people who manipulate and take advantage. For example, you'd find certain people who would say they've got drug problems in their families, they've got domestic problems in their families, they've got matrimonial problems in their families, they'll go and approach the Swami. Hopefully that the Swami would basically pray for them and basically cure them, but they put their reliance on the Swami. Then you've got, within the Muslim community, people who will go to the sheikhs and the Molanas who will come with the Tawis and give them particular amulets and in certain instances charge them inordinate amounts of money for the purposes of exorcising them, exorcising demons, the jinns and genies. If they're infested with jinns and genies, they go to these Molanas and sheikhs and, and alims, some people from Timbuktu, some of them you see advertisements and they'll go and exorcise them and hopefully cure. But the person still has particular problems in his family, in his lifestyle. And then, of course, you also got a variety, and I was here, sometimes I come to the court quite often in uh, Florence Nightingale Drive. People, from the Christian perspective, particularly the evangelical variety, it's important to make a distinction that sometimes you have the charismatics, and then sometimes you have what we would call mainstream Christians, everyday Christians, people that you can talk to, speak to, like my friend in front of me here. Uh, Pastor Bob Freddy. And then of course you've got the other variety which are bent on a particular variety or particular extreme variety on faith. All these are extreme varieties on faith. Now sometimes you'd have, and since we're discussing the whole issue of discover Jesus, sometimes you'd have these preachers and these pastors basically believing that all of us, all of you sitting here are destined for hellfire. Um, and, and you have, you have even, even these so-called international evangelists come into chats with people like, um, help me, uh, uh, Benny Hinn, um, who was some time back. You'll go and he'll, 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 he'll have a whole series of people here um, being possessed and then he'll just place his hands on them and then suddenly the person is instantaneously cured in the name of Christ or in the name of Jesus. Many Christians, many genuine Christians will tell you that these particular people are fraudsters, like we'd have fraudsters in the Muslim community, like you'd have fraudsters in the Hindu community. But in large proportion, why this is important to discuss, because this variety of faith has become extremely popular. Not just in Chatsworth, but certainly if you look at the variety, like the Southern Baptist variety in the United States, people like the, uh, you know, the Pat Robertsons and the late Jerry Falwells and so on, that kind of variety is coming closer and closer towards communities like this, like in the Chatsworth area, like the Phoenix area. And more often than not, they use the manipulation on the basis of material gain. You accept Christ and you basically get material gain. You'd have sometimes Muslims will do the same thing, Hindus will do the same thing. And we need to speak about that. Now in that context, I've been asked, um, because I'm told, and certainly I have a different, not necessarily a same perspective, but um, that's one of the issues I've been told by people who've come to the IPCI and the staff who stay in the chat with the area, that that's an issue we need to look at. And so we're here discussing the topics for today. The topic that was advertised in the Eastern Express and certainly in a few pamphlets in your post box was Discover Jesus, a man or a God. Now, this can be easily answered with 
a counterclaim. Discovered Jesus a man or God, you answer that with a counterclaim. Did he claim to be God? Did he claim to be Allah? Did he claim to be Yahweh? Elohim? What was the criteria that he used? What did he suggest? You see, we have here, I'm sure all of you know who he is. Mahatma Gandhi, meaning great soul, or Mohandas Kramshan Gandhi. I believe there was a program shown last night uh, uh, by Richard Attenborough in the afternoon uh, with Ben Kingsley, Gandhi. There was a point in time in India, certainly during the height of Gandhi, when um, the British certainly had made their particular um, incentives and their, and their colonial incursions in the Indian subcontinent. People in India claimed that Gandhi was the eleventh incarnation of God. Rama was the seventh incarnation of God. Krishna was the eighth incarnation of God. Buddha was the ninth incarnation of God. And of course Gandhi was the eleventh incarnation of God. So in other words, incarnation is the idea where God comes down to earth as a man. And in ancient societies, you look at the, even societies in North and in, in Europe, the Scandinavian communities, they believed that God Almighty he was holy, He was absolutely holy, He was an embodiment of holiness. You, the human being, being subjected to natural limitations, we are created by God. What right does it give the Creator to make rules and regulations for the created. Because the creator doesn't experience the same feelings that the created experience. Like the Pope, someone had suggested some years ago when Pope John Paul II was around, he wanted to make a pronouncement on the pill. And um, someone cynically remarked, what, 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 what gives the Pope to make a pronouncement on the pill? Because he doesn't play the same games that we play, <laughs> in a manner of speaking, crudely put. But the argument here was that if God does not experience the experiences of the, crea of the Creator, then it behoves Him to come down to earth as a man. And when He comes down to earth as a man, walks and talks as a man, then basically He would be more qualified to make pronouncement in terms of how individuals can rule and regulate themselves. Now if someone makes a claim, Gandhi was God. We counterclaim. Did Gandhi ever make that particular statement? Did he claim to be God? And the answer is no. So if you find 600 million Hindus in India who believe that Gandhi was God, then you'd basically draw them to their own pronouncements of this particular great man. What did he say? And the argument basically ends. Now, if you have to use an analogy and you amplify it further, one could equally say, and I'm not just saying from the, certainly the Muslim perspective, the Islamic perspective, we've got a particular view on this, but from a general perspective one could argue that as it stands there is not a single unequivocal statement in the context of the New Testament where Jesus would make the claim or the proclamation or the declaration where he would say he is God or where he would say worship me. You would read passages and they came and worshipped him or some translations would say they made obeisance to Jesus. But he never said, he never made the proclamation I am God. He never made the declaration worship me. What does a man say? If he doesn't say that then on what grounds do you lay the claim to basically ascribe divinity to this mighty messenger of God. In 1840, there was this gentleman here called Thomas Carlyle. In London, in the hubs and, and in London's East End and West End, if they existed back then, he delivered a series of lectures on the topic, the prophet as a hero dealing with the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad at a time when Muhammad was the most maligned man in, 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 in Western Europe, in, in Orientalist literature, in Western literature, hated, 
uh, you'd have commentaries, books, writings on him, look at the works of Dante and go on. But in the introduction to this particular book, he says, in the history of the world, <coughs> there will never again be any man ever so great that his fellow men will take as God. In other words, humanity has reached such a level of intellectual development that that evolutionary characteristic inherent in every man that no man can take another as God. And Islam as a system would stand in that particular trajectory of wanting to liberate fellow man from the worship of man to the worship of God. And we're not just talking about idols today. You look at the cults we find around us. You look at the time of Michael Jackson, the late Jackson, and the kind of euphoria that they created. You go to these rock concerts, what happens? It's a kind of a new ingrained religious development that is being inculcated in human beings where they now transfer godhood onto these so-called beings. That's part and parcel of the development of man. It's inherent in our characteristic. Anything we see, we accept. If I were to fly like a bird, some people would take me as a god. But it's the individual mind and the development and the idiosyncrasies that surround the individual would make him to basically come to a specific light. This was a, a portrait <coughs> of a suffering prophet. We call him the minor prophets and the major prophets. This is a prophet Job. Now, interestingly enough, in Job chapter 25, verse 4, here he lies, as you can see, um, in all his glory, but he basically asks the question. He asks a rhetorical question in the book of Job. He says, how then can man be justified with God? How? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Ye the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a maggot, and the son of man who is a worm. Son of man, referring to slightly higher than man, referring to prophets of God, for example. Jesus himself could be declared as a son of man. For as Jonah was, so shall the son of man. Or it has come to pass that the son of man shall do X, Y, and Z, and so on. You read the gospel accounts. So in this context, the man is viewed as a maggot. The son of man worm, slightly higher, higher spiritual level, being a recipient of revelation. But that is a criteria Job used. How can man be justified with God? So coming back then to Carlyle's quotation and applying it, we further ask about the contemporaries in the time of Jesus. Did they view him as God? We are told in the Gospels when Jesus was eight days old, he was circumcised, as any Jewish child would do. In that particular context, the physician, would we, he think, crudely speaking, that he was circumcising God, in inverted commas, when the child was developing, questioning the teachers in the, in the particular uh, synagogues, did they think that they were being questioned by God? Look at the contemporaries in his particular time. In Surah Maida, you don't have a towel by any chance here, the study. heat is just excessive. If we have to look at Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 119, we have a metaphorical allusion to an instance or a conversation that would take place probably on the Day of Judgment, where God will say, it says, And behold, God will say, O Jesus, the son of Mary, did you say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of God, referring to Mariolatry. He will say, glory to you. <coughs> Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, you would indeed have known it. You know what is in my heart, though I know not what is in yours, for you know full all that is hidden. The ilm ghaib Never said I to them aught except what you command me to say, which is, worship God, my Lord, and your Lord. And I was a witness over them, whilst I dwelt amongst them, and so on. Now, at the outset, basically, you find a denunciation of the divinity of Christ. Jesus Christ says in the Quran, I never made the claim to being God. But if I were to open up the New Testament, 
I could well see that the same argument can be found in the context of the New Testament. Where Jesus again exhorts people to call man to the worship of one God. He for example says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19 verse 16 to 17. One came up to him and said, <clears throat> Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him and, and proclaimed, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Reflecting on the humility of the man, that he wouldn't allow someone to even call him good. Why callest thou me good? There's only one good, and that is God himself. In Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus says, All power, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In John chapter 5 verse 30, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that had sent me. Now, many might say, well, let look at the context. Don't take an atomistic interpretation of Scripture, and I would, I would agree. Don't look at Scripture in isolation. Sometimes we want to extract verses and passages from the Quran or from the Bible, and we look at them in isolation, we wrench them out of context, and we make a religion out of it. You can make a religion out of holy war. You can make a religion out of jihad. Anything. So I'm saying, look at the context, go back. If I'm quoting out of context, let's look at the uh, verse again. He goes on to say, I by the finger of God cast out devils. When he, lifts, when he gives or when he brings back Lazarus back to life, he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. In other words, thou hast answered my prayers. And I know thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. These superstitious, credulous people, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Why did he send, say his prayer out loud? Because the people might misunderstand his particular prayer. Or they might misunderstand him. They might believe that, look, it's him that's bringing life or basically resuscitating Lazarus when in actual fact the power comes from Almighty God comes from God himself and Jesus is merely a recipient of revelation and God's special messenger a word the word of God as you might call <clears throat> then in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 and I won't labor too much on this Peter's testimony where Peter says Yea, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, a man approved of God amongst you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So, that in a sense gives you the criteria, and there are hundreds of other verses of similar nature in the entire purport of the gospel. Some identical, some similar, depending of course on where you read. Now it's important. And just to give you a practical demonstration. I've got a particular essay written by Bart Ehrman who's, who's in fact, in fact, I might just share that with you. Uh, interesting book by Bart Ehrman. He's the... Uh, uh, distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, one of the leading biblical authorities in the world today. Uh, he wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus. Uh, this phenomenal book, which I would urge, which in fact I would urge many Christians to get, the New Testament and historical introduction to early Christian writings, and this one here, which is quite fascinating, called Jesus Interrupted. Now in this particular book, and, 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 he, and he basically gives um, an illustration of evolution. And just tell me, if you people don't understand, just pick up your hands. Or if I'm going too fast, pick up your hands and let me know. He deals with an opening illustration to show the evolutionary transition. Thanks. And the textbook case which he uses, thanks for that brother is uh, Mark and John, showing the evolution from Mark and John. Most scholars believe that Mark was the first gospel to be written. Um, some say it was probably around the year 65 
to the era 70 of the common era. John's gospel, the gospel according to John, for Christians know, was probably written in about 110. Some radical uh, scholars would put it even further up, 120. The conservative scholars would put it around about 100, 100 AD. Now, the first 10 chapters of Mark are about Jesus' public ministry in Galilee, the northern parts of Israel where he teaches, where he cures the sick, where he heals the sick, casts out demons, confronts his Jewish opponents, and, and so on. At the end of his life in Mark, I believe it's chapter 11 to chapter 16, he makes a journey to, to Jerusalem in order to celebrate what we would call um, this. To celebrate, do you know what this is? That's a Passover. So, <clears throat> where he celebrates Jewish Passover in Mark, and then whilst he's there celebrating the Passover, he is arrested and then he is subsequently crucified. Mark chapter 11 to chapter 16. Now, just follow me on this particular line. Because you need to provide some kind of background information. You see, in the days of Jesus, the Passover, which was held annually, and I believe it's still held uh, uh, you know, today in Israel, um, was one of the most important Jewish festivals. And it was to institute um, uh, for the purposes of commemorating the Exodus. You know the Exodus that had occurred centuries later uh, in the time of Moses. You see, according to the account, the children of Israel, they were enslaved by Pharaoh for 400 years, but God heard their cries, He heard their prayers, He heard their sorrows, and um, He sent and raised a Savior for them, and that Savior was Moses. Now Moses was sent to Pharaoh and demanded, um, you know, speaking for God, that he let his people go. And, um, and, and, and God empowered Moses, and in order to persuade him, God sent down Plagues, you know the ten horrible plagues. Uh, there's locusts and there's frogs and there's uh, blood in the Nile River. Whether it's metaphorical, whether it's literal, we don't know. But the point are, uh, we are told that these plagues uh, basically affected Egypt. And then subsequently, Pharaoh um, recalculated. He both said, let them go. Then when he goes, when the Egyptians, when the children of Israel and Moses goes, on the Red Sea, Pharaoh comes with his mighty army, and basically we know the history. The Red Sea apparently splits, and Pharaoh and his army are drowned. 600,000, we are told. And so Israel was slave, uh, saved from its slavery in Egypt. Now, God commanded Moses from that time onwards that the Israelites were to commemorate this great event by having the Passover, the annual celebration. And at that particular point in time, what the Jews would do, they would bring a lamb. You know, like Bakri Eid, what they call the, the, the Qurbani on uh, Eid al-Adha. Many Muslims don't understand the significance, but similar to that, they would have a lamb being sacrificed. And that happened that they would take it home, prepare the meal, and that would happen on the day of preparation for the Passover. Now the only confusing aspect of the celebration involves the way ancient Jews um, told time, the same way as modern Jews would do. Because the Sabbath begins on a Saturday, but it actually starts on a Friday. So the day of preparation, the lamb was slaughtered, and the meal was prepared in the afternoon. Now if you look to mark accounts of Jesus' death, Jesus and his disciples, they made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. In Mark chapter 14 verse 12, the disciples asked Jesus whether they are to prepare the Passover meal for that particular evening. That evening. In other words, that is on the day of the preparation for the Passover. The day before the Passover they prepare that meal the day before the Passover. And they make the preparations, they go ahead, and Jesus gives them instructions, and the, and the beginning of the Passover, and they have the meal. And it's a special meat indeed, because Jesus uses that symbolically. He takes the unleavened bread, He breaks it, He says, this is my body. He takes a cup of wine and says, this is the blood of the covenant, that is poured out for many meaning that his own blood must be shed on the day of preparation. And then after the disciples eat the Passover meal, they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they pray. Judas Iscariot brings the troops. They arrest him. 
Jesus then dies. The next day they arrest him. And on the next day, on the day of the Passover, the morning after the Passover meal was eaten, Jesus was killed. He was crucified. In Mark chapter 15 verse 25. Now, that's one account. People can just put off the cell phones, please. That's one account in Mark. Jesus dies, uh, sorry, he basically eats, he dies on the day of Passover, the day, the morning after the Passover meal was basically eaten. The day after the Passover meal was eaten. Now, in John's Gospel, which I say is an evolution, and it's something that we need to look at and unpack. The basic story is more or less the same. Jesus goes to Jerusalem in the last week of his life to celebrate the Passover feast. And here too, there is a last meal, a betrayal, a trial before Pilate, and the crucifixion. But it is striking that in John, in John's Gospel, at the beginning of the account, in contrast to Mark's Gospel, the disciples do not ask Jesus where they are to go and prepare the Passover. So consequently, he gives them no indication for the preparation of the Passover meal. They do eat a final supper together, but that's not the Passover meal. Jesus says nothing about his bread being symbolic of his body, or the blood being symbolic of the representing his own blood. Instead, in John's Gospel, he washes the disciples' feet, a story which is not told in any of the other Gospels. After the meal, they go out, Jesus is betrayed by Judas, Pilate finds him guilty and condemns him to be crucified. And then we are told in John 19 verse 14, it w and we are told exactly when Pilate pronounces a sentence on Jesus. There he says, it was a day of preparation for the Passover. And it was noon. Noon? On the day of the preparation of the Passover? The day the lambs were actually slaughtered? How is that possible? Because in Mark's Gospel, Jesus lived through that entire day. You know, when you're sacrificing the lambs. Jesus lived through that entire day. But in John's Gospel, Jesus is crucified on the day of the preparation for the Passover. Where the day that the lambs were to be sacrificed. In John, Jesus dies a day earlier on the day of the preparation for the Passover, sometimes afternoon. Now, I don't think that this difference can in fact be reconciled. People over the years have tried, but some have pointed out that Mark also indicates that Jesus died on a day that is called the day of preparation. Uh, Mark 15 verse 42. But that's true, but what the readers fail to notice is that Mark tells us that the day of preparation in that context was a day of preparation for the Sabbath, which would be the Saturday. So in other words, in Mark, this is not the day before the Passover meal was eaten, but the day before the Sabbath. But in John's Gospel, Jesus dies on the day of the preparation for the Passover. Why? Why is that the case? But the significant feature is this. The last of John's Gospels was written something like 25 years after Mark's. John is the only Gospel which indicates that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now you see the link. That in John's Gospel, Jesus was die, dies as a sacrificial lamb on the day of the preparation for the Passover. In Mark's Gospel, he basically has that meal, the Passover meal, and then he dies the next day. The reason for this is that there is an evolution. Mark was the first gospel to be written, John was the last gospel to be written, and hence there is the evolutionary development from Mark to Matthew to Luke to John. Therefore, for example, when you read a passage like um, John chapter 1, verse 1, or for example, um, you'd see here John chapter 1, um, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehend. Uh, where do I go further? That was a true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Now that idea can't be found in any of the other gospel. It's not in Mark's gospel. 
But if you understand the context behind the evolutionary development of these Gospels, you begin to understand the, 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 how the idea developed. Now Jesus was sacrificed as a lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Symbolically speaking and ironically on the day of the preparation for the Passover. Which never occurred in Mark's Gospel. So, in a sense then, what we as Muslims and indeed as Christians have to do. Is that to understand what the author is saying. To understand what the Quran is saying. To understand what the Hadith is saying. We have to look at the detail of each particular account and by no means treat one account as though it's saying the same thing as another account. John is different from Mark. Um, if we want to understand, understand what John is saying about Jesus, then we can't basically go to Mark's gospel to basically understand what Mark was saying about Jesus because they were uh, writing for different audiences and different communities, living at different points in time. So naturally the ideas and the views would be different. Here's the picture that I was talking about Jesus at the Passover meal, the day of the preparation for Passover with the, with the disciples. In John, it's not there. In John, Jesus was a sacrificial lamb. So he's killed. And basically the sentence is pronounced by Pontius Pilate, as we see in John chapter 19 verse 14. It was a day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon when Jesus was killed. In Mark, it was a day after. Can you see the reason? The evolution of the gospel accounts. I know my good friend had, had raised a point here, you know, I was pointing out in, in the past that, you know, when you look at the whole notion of, 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 of the virgin birth, which, which Muslims, many Muslims in fact accept that and believe it from the Quran, but sometimes it's interesting to also look that in history we have cases where you'd find all these mothers or mother goddesses in history giving birth to children who were born through miraculous means. We've got an example of the Indian goddess Isis and the infant Iswara, uh, the goddess Oranya, the goddess Devka and the infant Krishna. Right in the end, the Babylonian goddess uh, Semiramis, Queen Semiramis and the incarnate son uh, uh, Tammuz. And then of course we've got the Roman Catholic in the center, right in the bottom, Mother Mary and Jesus. But it's interesting that when you see the similarities in ancient history and how religion evolves and how it develops, how you find these kind of parallels in history. Sometimes we need to question. When you look at um, you know, some of these um, uh, gods and, and godlings and goddesses in, in, in prehistory in the Roman times, you have here for example Bacchus who is a pagan sun god. Then you've got uh, um, Dionysus was also the pagan sun god. Then you've got people like Mithra from Mithraism. And you've got um, Sol Invictus and so on. And interestingly enough, all these individuals had similar characteristics to that of Jesus. Atosophrygia, for example, here you have um, two examples. One is Atosophrygia, the other was Dionysus of Bacchus, um, who is the god who turned water into wine. But if you look at the similarities, all of them were, for example, born on the 25th of December. All were considered saviors who were slain for mankind. In most instances, they were performing mighty miracles. They were traveling teachers. The body was symbolized as bread. In this guy's case, in Dionysus' case, he was viewed as a god of wine, vine, turned water into wine, considered the king of kings, only begotten son, savior, redeemer, and also, interestingly, identified as the Lamb of God. In fact, there is a book called, uh, I believe it's called by S. Acharya, um, the history of Christ or the Christ conspiracy and there's another book called Pagan Sun Gods. I forget the author's name, maybe if you want to see me later we can look that up, where you have a whole host of gods and goddesses having the similar characteristics as that of Jesus and we need to question ourselves why, how come, what is the reason, what's the rationale behind this. Another example, Horus the Sun God, the world's crucified saviors, this was a halo on Peter and so on. Now, the sun wheel, the sun wheel halo, symbolic of the sun god. This was around Saint Peter. What do we make of this? What do we make of these particular criteria and characteristics? 
The Christian message about Jesus essentially revolves around um, three major facts. One would be the incarnation, the other would be the crucifixion, and the other issue would be the resurrection. Now, if you, for example, look at something like the Trinity, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. How do you find any kind of justification for that in the context of the biblical scriptures, the biblical revelation? The closest approximation to that would be what you would find in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But you basically unpack it, you look at it, and you find that most of the modern translations, most of the modern translations like the NIV, like the Revised Standard Version, like the New American Bible, they don't contain those passages anymore. Why not? Because many scholars are now pointing out that this was nothing more than a footnote. These were footnotes that were inserted and developed by some scribe who wanted to impose a certain particular type of theology or philosophy on his particular people. John chapter 1 verse 1. What about John chapter 1 verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In that context we see the Word being God. Many Christians would say this is an indication of Jesus being God. If you have to look at the Greek, um, it's something like en arche, en ho logos, kai ho logos, en pros ton theon kai theos. The word for God in the first instance is different from the God in the second instance. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, God Almighty, Tontheon, meaning God Almighty, and in the next instance, simply Theos. The article is different behind the Word for the first God, in contrast to the second instance where God appears, which means that God being the Word is not the same. Jesus is not the same as God Almighty. Like God tells Moses, I will make thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be your prophet. What's he saying? Is he saying that, 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 that Moses is now God? No. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4, the devil is the God of this world. Is the devil God Almighty? No. Meaning the leader, person, the adversary, who will take men away from the worship of the one true God, to the worship of man, or to the basic um, um, evil that man is committing in this world today. It's interesting to note that between the year 180 and 210, the word Father was added before Almighty. Prior to that, the, 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 the kind of declaration of faith was, I believe in God, the Almighty. No problem in that. Word Father was inserted. Nothing wrong with the word Father, but in the context in which it's evolved, in the context in which it's developed, there might be a problem. And that was, of course, bitterly contested by bishops, leaders of the church, Bishop Victor, Bishop Zephysius, condemned it. They opposed the tendency to regard Jesus as divine and stressed in the unity of God as expressed in the original teachings of Christ. This was another individual, Irenaeus, between 130 to 280. He was a bishop of Lyons in South France. He criticized Paul, interestingly enough, for being responsible for inject injecting doctrines of, of pagan Greek religions and Platonic philosophy. And he was murdered in the year 280. You go on, Irenaeus. These were the church fathers. Tertullian, a bishop of Carthage stressed on the unity of God and said that Trinity as a word and as a concept was never mentioned in the Christian, in the, in the scriptures. Now these were church fathers, these were not, I mean many people would for example utilize them in establishing the authority of the New Testament. They would say, well you look at the writings, you look at the patristic writings, you look at the writings of the church fathers, Irenaeus for example. So why reject them when they basically make certain salient points? Leonidas, killed in 208 from Egypt, was murdered because he founded a center of learning and followed apostolic Christianity and rejected the doctrines innovated by Paul. And naturally the Pauline church did not approve of his teachings. He was murdered in 208. 
AD. Origen, son of Leonidas, became the Bishop of Palestine, tortured till he died for rejecting the Trinity. And he was condemned by the Council of Alexandria, tortured in 254 AD till he died. Lucian died in 312 AD. Same situation. He held that Jesus was subordinate to God, not equal to God. And he was tortured several times and put to death in 312. In fact, he revised the Septuagint, one of the key individuals for doing that. Then you go on. This is an interesting chap, Arius, the Arian controversy. Between 250 to 336 AD, he became the bishop of, born in Libya. He was the bishop of Alexandria and was the student of Lucian, described as the, as the rock. The interesting thing, and I don't want to belabor too much time because my good friend um, um, Stemkize will also be addressing us for some time. On the Christian front, about 318 of the common era, there was a controversy between two churchmen in Alexandria. One was Arius, who was a deacon, and Alexander, who was the bishop. Now, Emperor Constantine stepped into the fray. And what he did was, he sent these men many letters encouraging them to come together and put aside their particular difference. Now, the point is this, is that Constantine believed in Sol Invictus. He was a pagan sun god. At a particular point in time, he had a battle with his rival Maxentius. He also noticed there was a growing Christian community in Rome. And he knew that as a result of basically bringing these communities into his fold, what he would do, he needed their support. Any differences between the Christian communities would obviously cause the decline and fall of any support base that he would hold to muster. So the main thing he wanted to do was get these communities together, get them to come to an agreement, come to some kind of common agreement. And so what he did was that after several attempts to pacify these groups, he convened a council, one of the first councils, called the, the, the Nicene Council of the Council of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era. And at this Council of Nicaea, all these different disputes and controversies and, 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 and ideas and views and disputations were looked upon and they were basically, he attempted to resolve them. One was the concept of the Trinity. The other was the observance of the Passover on Easter Sunday. And so Constantine realized that this unified church was necessary for a strong kingdom. When the negotiations failed to settle the dispute, what did he do? He called for a vote. He called for a vote. And the council met and they voted as to on the Trinity and they voted in terms of whether Jesus was God or not. And of course the majority won. The majority won, they effectively voted Jesus into position of God with an amendment condemning all Christians who believed in the unity of God. Those Christians who believed in the unity of God, they were condemned. Um, and uh, you'd see the pictures that I'd basically show you later. For example, Arius' belief if I could just go up on this slide. He believed in absolutely one God and said that if, if the act of generation is attributed to God, then he destroys the singularity of God and ascribes corporeality. He believed that Jesus was a man who was born miraculously without a father and that he was a messenger of God. What's the difference? He was, what's the difference between him and the Islamic belief? None. Identical. Arius. Nobody follows him. A Unitarian. The Oxford Dictionary defines Arianism as a principal hearsay denying the divinity of Christ named after its author Arius. And it was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in, 320, in, in, in 325 and again at Constantinople in 381. Uh, but it, 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 it driven through from the empire, it retained a foothold amongst the Teutonic tribes in Europe. Now these communities, I just want to show you what happened to them. These were the different communities that you had at that particular point in time, different Christian communities. And um, when they were persecuted, what happened? They were hung, they were sent to the Circus Maximus 
to be eaten up alive by the lions. Because Rome basically was becoming, Christianity was becoming the official state religion under the then Roman church. So naturally speaking, what would then happen is that if that's going to become the main official faith, those who subscribe to a tenet different from Christian faith would obviously be tortured and persecuted for their belief. They were persecuted. In fact, um, Jerome said the whole world groaned and marveled to find itself Aryan. These were the different communities that you'd find. Uh, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Lombards, those were in the northern Germanic region. Eunomians. The Aryans were, as you can see, from the Egyptian region at that particular time. And then, of course, they were combined with different barbaric communities. That was a battle of Milvian Bridge that I spoke about where there was a battle between Constantine and Maxentius. This was the creed which I told you about in 325. The bishops voted between the Trinity and the unity of God and the Trinity concept was voted for by the delegates who didn't support it but were afraid of murder. One of them said the soul is nothing worse for a little ink. So in other words, what else? Just put this down in writing. We accept this. And what then happened? they came up with the what we would call the Athanasian Creed. The Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Fa Holy Spirit is not the Son, but the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, referring to that one Godhead. Of course, pointing to the divinity of Christ. And that was a creed. We believe in one God, the Father, all sovereign, maker of all things visible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, homosian to patri, through whom all things were made, things in heaven. Here we have another instance, Melchizedek, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. We say a candidate for divinity. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Look at the context. Who prays to Melchizedek? No one. But does that, the idea, without any descent, here's a candidate for divinity alone. Jesus had an apparent beginning and an apparent end. Here we have someone who has no beginning and no end. Melchizedek. John 14, 28, Jesus says that the Father is greater than I. God is able to do everything. Do we accept that? Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. Who believes that God knows everything? Do we accept that God knows everything? But Jesus says, of that day and that hour, no one has knowledge, not even the angels, nor the Son, but the Father, in Mark chapter 13, verse 32. God speaks for Himself. Jesus says, Whosoever I hear or I have heard from Him, these things I speak, meaning revelation. Does God pray? Jesus cries out, My God, my God. In the garden, in the, in the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, did he mean myself, myself, why have you forsaken me? And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God and said, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In other words, as a true Muslim, submitting his will to the will of God. Jesus' power, not his own. Peter's testimony. Jeffrey Hunter, he acted in the movie King of Kings. And there was a, a scene where he were to climb up the mount, um, the same mountain that Jesus climbed. And where he climbed up and he walked and he experienced the sweating and the, 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 uh, the, the anguish and the fatigue. And he made a noted Remark, he said, for the first time in my life, I realized how human Jesus was. Jeffrey Hunter. He experienced it. And then, of course, we've got other Jesus Christ superstar movies by the Andrew Lloyd Webber. There was an article which I had called Christian Muslim Relations in a Postmodern Age. There were different things that this article proposed that Muslims do and different the trajectories that the article proposed that Christians would do. I wish I could have brought it along. I would have articulated the views far more 
candidly than I would do right now. With Christians, the recommendation was that Christians should in general <coughs> can still be Christians by simply accepting certain criteria. One was, which he said, accepting the historical personage of Christ as the moral exemplification of deity. But it doesn't mean that you basically raise Christ to the status of being God himself. If you accept that criterion, you can still be a Christian. You can still be a good Christian. Because nothing in that particular system would go against the teachings of the Bible. Why? In the context of the New Testament, there's absolutely no indication whatsoever where Christ makes a claim that He is God or where He says, worship me. So if you take that into implication, if you take that by analogy and you accept that and you internalize that, you can still be a Christian. It's not a question of trying to impose some faith upon the other. Look, think, reflect. Don't change, the, don't, don't basically stick to the same idea or view rigidly before it's too late. In the world today we have um, many people giving you different views and opinions on how the um, sun circumambulates around the world or how the, uh, the sorry, the, the earth um, rotates around the sun and we've got certain instances how the gravity operates, how scientific views, uh, uh, theories come forth. More often than not, there's so much of hot air, scientists give no credit to them because they're not substantial proof. I'm saying we need to go beyond the milk beyond what our people have taught us, beyond what our forefathers or perhaps our ancestors or our communities teach us. Look, think, reflect. The greatest challenge that society can pose to the establishment is a thinking mind. Not just the political establishment, also the religious establishment. Once society starts to think, once society maintains that interpretative relationship with God himself, then society is going on towards a trajectory of being truly liberated. Liberated from the enslavement of man to the worship of the one and true God. I'd like to end with the quotation from the Quran which says, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلْ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُكَ That when truth comes out against that which is, which is inaccurate, then truth shall invariably prevail. For truth, by its very nature, is bound to prevail. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, if I might have stretched the particular lecture, please forgive me. Um, but I do hope we can proceed from this basis, and I would hereby call our next speaker, Mr. Jabulani Mkize. Um, as I do understand, he, he did spend a considerable amount of his time studying in the United States, he was um, uh, probably up to how many years ago, a pastor? Up to 2000, up to 2007, um, a pastor ministering. Um, he's left ministering, and of course, he'll give you his particular perspective and his his reasons for that. Um, but I, he bumped into me in. Uh, Gray Street, probably about four, five, maybe six weeks ago, and um, in his engagements and in his discussions, um, I found him highly articulate, I found him highly sophisticated in his approach, um, and I found him some, someone that you can engage with and deal with on, on Muslim and on Christian issues. So, without further ado, um, I hope all of us give him the same time and opportunity and patience, and then of course the floor would be open to all of you to raise any questions or comments that you wish to make. So without further ado, I call uh, Jabulani Mkize. Thank you.